Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014. Brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Okay, welcome back. We're live here in San Francisco, VMworld 2014. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier. Um, really pleased, fifth year now broadcasting theCUBE uh, at VMworld, and it's been an amazing uh, run. VMware is changing every year. It gets bigger and bigger, um, but it's still a geek show, and it's just a great company. Uh, brand new campus in Silicon Valley. I had Pat Gelsinger on yesterday, and, and one of the things that's happening at uh, VMware is the story is there's a lot of alumni that are <coughs> flying from the nest that have been there from the roots, and um, CEOs starting companies, but most importantly, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley starting, uh, helping companies start companies, fund them. And our next two guests are two great uh, VMware alumni, Jerry Chen, who's a general partner at Greylock, and Pete Sonsini, general partner at New Enterprise Associates, or NEA. Guys, well, it's great, great to see you guys on theCUBE again. Thanks. Great to see you here. Thanks for having us. You guys are the money, money bags for all the <laughs> startups. And Jerry, you, um, you and I talked at Amazon reInvent, I think last year. Yep. You were looking for your first deal. You know, you know all about VMware, you kind of know what's going on in the market. And Docker was just starting to float around, got a lot of traction, and you reeled that in. I mean, it's the first, uh, you know, is there a sophomore jinx in your future? I mean, that's a good deal. Tell us about Docker and all the success and, uh, and the ride Docker's been. Look, I, 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 it felt like a, maybe it was rookie luck or something. It was my first investment, and uh, largely because uh, when you see Docker, you just realize the value is going to bring, and P and I saw that from the early days of VMware, and so I understood kind of the value VMware had in the early days. That combined with some of the knowledge I had around how apps were being built for tomorrow, I'm like, this just makes sense, and I'll be honest, I mean, I knew Docker was a great technology, and the team was phenomenal, but to think an uh, open source project that's been around for less than two years was like on the keynote at VMworld, it was pretty amazing to think about how far it's come. And I've, of course, Amazon owns public cloud. The DevOps movement is in full, full tilt. Um, but the enterprises are at a huge threat. I was calling Amazon the tsunami that was going to wash upon shore. The question is, how much of each will they take? And who will step up and put that seawall up to stop the onslaught for Amazon? Um, so Docker really becomes a key linchpin in that formula because all the same buzzwords are around interoperability. These are enterprise terms, right? I mean, this is sure. an enterprise opportunity. Do you see the same thing? Well, I think it, it crosses through um, consumer software, enterprise software, um, public and private cloud. And I think P and I see the same thing. There's probably no startup that we see today that's not using Docker, right? Every VP of engineering, every CTO that's coming through our offices is using Docker as this um, Lego building block, as an atomic unit of the cloud. So the beauty of Docker is you can make what you want out of it, and if for an enterprise use case, you're going to see a whole ecosystem grow up around it, uh, around the enterprise. Pete, I want to uh, ask you a few questions around the enterprise space. Obviously, you're, you know, we've all enterprise guys, and it's now sexy to be in the enterprise. Um, the enterprise are the hot deals. Consumers, you know, obviously, valuations are high, and that's kind of in the bloom is coming off the rose there. Still hot, but more importantly, enterprise is smoking hot. You've been, you've been uh, doing a lot of enterprise deals, uh, XCal uh, grad, um, a lot of stuff coming out of Berkeley that's software. So the enterprise really has this kind of OS software play, we talk about software stacks in the last segment. What's your, what's your take on the enterprise transformation? You, you're doing big data deals with Databricks, you've been in the enterprise. What's going on in the enterprise? Why is it so hot? Break that down for us. Well, I think uh, you know, looking at the, the infrastructure layer, uh, which I think is the most relevant to this crowd here, um, it's, it's hot for several reasons. It's, it's uh, you know, there's just a lot, I, I think the biggest reason why it's hot right now is because there are these incredible open source disruptions that are going on, and it's, there's just several of them that are just completely shaking everything up. And, um, I mean, you look at, of course, started with Hadoop, and then uh, you look at uh, Spark that came through, uh, we're talking about Docker now, there's OpenStack, there's you know, Cloud Foundry, I mean, there's these incredible things that are going on um, caused by these open source disruptions, and it's, it's shaking everything up. I mean, people are, have jumped on Docker so fast, and, uh, what's interesting to me is, is uh, how quickly, um, you know, kind of the big incumbents have started to embrace these open source projects, and it's, it kind of used to be that they were kind of lying in wait, and maybe they'd come in and plunge in and make a big acquisition like a Zen source or something like that, but now they're, I mean, from Hadoop to Cloud Foundry to, to Docker to on and on, the, these large incumbents, 
VMware are embracing them early, which is really creating a, a very strange kind of dynamic. So to answer your question, it's, it's uh, these, these are major things that are going on, and they're, they're these open source projects, and, and the question is from, from, my, from our standpoint, is you know, how do you make money off them? And so that's what, we're, that's what, we, that's what we look to do for our LPs, uh -huh. and, and we can go on and on about that. But that's why things are You know, I, love, yeah, I love that answer, because you know, you, a lot of entrepreneurs get on core or reading, all oh, this, this myth about venture capitals and startups. At the end of the day, it's a money-making proposition. You guys are not philanthropists. You're there to fund innovation. Um, but you brought up the enterprise thing and then all this disruption. The time to value now on startups is much different. Talk about the cycle times in the enterprise deals. It used to be it's the slow boat to China kind of thing or the airplane that needs to ramp up to 30,000 feet, whatever metaphor you want to use. Right, sure. It used to be in the old days, you can track these deals and now they're happening faster. What cycle times are you seeing in terms of funding, valuations, exits, growth? Uh, is it faster or, is it, or what's going on? I, I don't know if it's faster. I'll take two points, I'd love to hear Pete's opinion. I think with startups versus incumbents, it's a race between technology and distribution. So the large incumbents have channels, sales forces, like install basic customers. The startups typically have better technology or new innovation. So it becomes a race between these startups trying to build distribution to get to the customers versus the incumbents trying to build or buy the technology, like Pete just said, like buying and Zen source to compete. And so what we're seeing now is a race between startups, you know, growing fast, building the building the go to market in addition to the technology versus the large incumbents like a VMware trying to like, you know, buy or build the technology to be relevant. And I think what we're seeing now is th there's a crossover in kind of the playbooks, right? So when I was a VMware, we made that decision to open source Cloud Foundry to kind of take a play from the open source market. Now see so you're seeing startups out there thinking, okay, how do I build a channel? How do I leverage guys like VMware or Google as a smaller company to get to my customers? So it's kind of funny to see that the, the playbooks between the two different um, species, if you will, are, are changing. You know, obviously there's a lot of flow back and forth of, of individuals and talent. Hey, your yeah, take on and that? So well, I totally agree. And and you know, the, there's the obvious thing that there's this Componentization of code so that it's, it's a lot easier to get a company up and going by calling on APIs and pulling in building blocks. So that's that's very much driving a lot of the startup activity. They can focus on adding value on top of these reusable components. So that's that's an important trend that is very much alive and, and is, is is continuing. Um, and and you know, like we were saying, you open source a project, it can take off in eight, you know in eighteen months. And so you get massive awareness and and and. You you get uh, you can go to market through that route, and then the, the flip side of it is how do you make money on it? And you know, so that's it's a balance you need to strike. So I got to ask you guys both the question from the entrepreneur's perspective out there watching and watching the video on demand is um, they all want to get an appointment. So you guys are hard to get, so you know, they'll get an intro. So feel free to call them. I'll give you their cell phone numbers. <laughs> and call them. But the real question is. Guys, what do, I'm an entrepreneur, what yeah. do I need to do to get your attention? Are there some key performance metrics? Are there growth hacks? What do you guys look for for an enterprise deal in this new modern era of cloud convergence, end user computing, software defined data center? I mean, it's a whole new ball game. There are, there are some transformational shifts. What do you guys look for in the team, in the business model? Are there table stakes check boxes? for enterprise deals today from your standpoint. Go ahead. Oh, Pete, you've been at it as long as well, I, mean, I, I, I mean, don't, And don't say, oh, I need a good team. That's assume uh -huh, they have a I good know. team. Uh -huh. The first point I want to make is that it's, there is a lot of very high quality projects going yeah. on. So it's, it really is just awesome to be in our business right now because you see so many incredible great things. So you, you need something to jump out at you, you know, because of that. I mean, this is not a time where I mean, we're spending our time, I mean, we, we definitely are open to taking meetings and you know, but there's only so many hours in the day, so you need to, somebody needs to jump out of you. At the end, of, that's really, I mean, to, to net it out, and it can be the team, the market, the technology, you know, all, to give you the same old cliches, but because of the time we're in, it, it, needs to, it needs to jump out. It can't be an email with a dear sir, you know, well, let, let me get more specific. So on the consumer side, it used to be 10 million is the new 1 million users. So you have to see some growth. I see you throw an app out there with a little DevOps and it grows, and it's flying, you can get some validation there. It's been de-risked, if you will. Enterprise, are there different mechanics involved? Because it's different qual criteria. Yeah. CIO, it's sure. infrastructure, is it compliance? I mean, are, and these are the things I'm looking for. It's like, I'm an entrepreneur, I did a prototype, that's kind of like what I'm looking for here. I think it depends on the stage of the company and also what you're trying to do. In general, the enterprise, I feel like it's more deterministic um, what's good or bad. Like, and consumers, non-deterministic, what's going to take off and get a big audience. But an enterprise, either you 
increase revenue or you decrease costs or both, right? So if you're a startup that has an idea or technology that can help me reduce my app capital expenses or operating costs or increase the revenue that I'm driving through my business, and in an order of magnitude better than the status quo. And that's the key. So in the enterprise, we're not looking for a 10 or 20% better, 3% better. You're not going to get um, a CIO or, or CFO's attention for a small improvement. But you can do something where you're 10 times faster, right? So um, pure storage, a flash storage company we're invested in, there's 10 times faster than disk, but at the same cost. Or um, Docker, right? You get better density, better performance of your application, the portability, so that it reduces costs as well. So I think if you look at one of those, two, those axes, and if you do <coughs> exceedingly well in one, you have a good investment. Great, and also now, this new, <coughs> new dimensions, you're seeing big data, Pete, you recently are, you know, I wouldn't say going off the reservation, because it's in your reservation, but it's, it's big data, is in the mix. I mean, big data is being discussed here uh, in VMworld, in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. so, What's the boundary, I guess, that's the question for you, for you on the enterprise. Where, where is the reservation kind of, where do you go off the reservation on deals? What are, what, what's not the enterprise from a, from a venture perspective? You mean, what, what is a technology that does not apply yeah, to what, the enterprise? what doesn't hit your radar? What, you know, as Pat Gelsman said, it's, not, it's, it's what you don't do that people want to know about. What deals don't you do? Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm focused on the infrastructure layer all the way up to the app layer. So I'm personally looking at all of the above. Um, you know, I, and there's, that's tons. I mean, yeah. I, you know. So I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, there are my partners that focus very much on security. I know a little bit about security, but I'm generally going to pawn off security-focused deals with my partner, Katu or John. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, we at NEA will do everything, I, I think, enterprise-related, infrastructure-related. Me personally, I, um, I will look at everything that is. And, uh, so I'll put you guys both on the spot. Today's Tuesday, yesterday's Monday, it's Monday partner meetings. Did you guys fund any companies yesterday? Greylock and NEA. Partners meeting. <laughs> um, Trade secrets. Do you fund every? Do you guys fund startups on every partner meeting? No, I, I think it's an <laughs> exception, right? Uh, you know, as Greg, we look at each partner does you know one to two new investments a year. So you, you play that out. The probability of us funding a company any given Monday is very low. <laughs> Uh, this, this is like this image, oh, they're sitting there putting money on the table every Monday. That's, that's not like that, it's pretty much mellow. Well, we right? do a lot of, I mean, we've got a big fund, we've got a two and a half billion dollar fund, so we're doing you know, 50 deals. You throw in our seed deals, we're doing probably 60, 70 deals a year. So we're doing a lot of deals. Most of them are Series A, Series B. Um, the partnership's designed to scale that way. So yeah, I mean, we're, you know, 52 partner meetings a year. Yeah. You know, maybe there's not quite 52, but um, <laughs> say 45. We're probably 45. We're doing we're doing a, a deal. Pretty we're good. doing a deal a meeting. So yeah, I'm looking at a deal right now. I went to my partnership with it yesterday, and uh, you know we'll see if it gets there. Uh, share, please share. No, <laughs> so I want to bring back more of the uh, VMware conversation because you guys both were uh, VMware. Pete, I think you were an early employee. What employee number were you at VMware? I uh, 60 something like so that. So sub 100, yeah, early days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jerry, you, when did you? About when, a couple hundred. A couple hundred, so talk about the culture. I want to ask you guys specifically, there is a lot of VMware alumni now. You and I were talking uh, uh, prior to VMworld, some uh, other firms have some junior partners coming in. You're seeing startups out there. There is a V-Mafia developing that has that DNA. What is, your, in your opinion, share with the folks out there that early Diane Green um, culture from the Stanford. I mean, it's a real geek culture, and how is that transforming? How do you guys see that now on the outside developing? Yeah, you know, I think you're probably seeing uh, a category of VMware executives, both on the product side, the business side, and the engineering side, uh, that have been alumni starting companies in the past few years because VMware, which is like once in a decade or once in a you know a career platform opportunities, we saw the intersection of software, hardware, storage, networking. So anyone that was coming out of, of VMware in the early days just has such a great perspective of the whole infrastructure stack, which is why you see A, a, a huge success like this, and B, a lot of alumni starting companies. And I think Diane um, was a great leader in the early days, she instilled you know, two or three things. One, just like relentless quality around the product. The, the engineering team and the technical team there was like you know, bar none, some of the best engineers I've ever worked with. And then also, just ruthless pragmatism trying to add value to help the customer. So I think you have that cultural intersection plus the, this, where we sat in the technology stack made a very special place yep. in the early days. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, I learned a lot from Diane in, with, uh, it to help me with the venture business and in, in, in sizing up entrepreneurs. I, I uh, you know, was a lot different working for her than it was um, you know, <laughs> reflecting on the learnings of her as a as um, you know, a such a gritty, such a gritty entrepreneur, yeah. So, I mean, you know, so I, 
I mean, what can I say? I learned a lot from her as to what it takes to win, um, how to be a chess player, how to grind it out, and... Uh, I think we're getting and, the hook you know, here. We're going to stand for a little bit longer. I want to get one final question, and sorry to interrupt you, but uh, they're trying to get in the next segment. But my last question is really more of a market one. Um, you know, the IPO window is open, um, and I want to get your both take on this. Some, a lot of companies are raising a ton of dough. Pure, obviously your, your portfolio company raised a ton of dough, big valuations. And there's a, lot, there's a pre IPO market developing with liquidity. Um, what's the impact of companies raising a boatload of money before they go public? Is that a Sarbanes Oxley issue? Andreessen brought this up on some uh, uh, crowdstorming he did on Twitter around this comment. But you know, it used to be you get public, everyone gets exit, everyone's happy. Now there is this little pre public kind of thing going on. Is, there a, is that good or bad for the industry in your perspective? Oh, I mean, it it depends on the company's strategy. You, you raise a lot of capital at high valuation, then in the public market may not you know, be able to stomach that valuation. Uh, and so you, it means you delay going public, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what your objective is from going public. Um, if it's to get liquidity, then you can get liquidity by doing some of these rounds, of course. I tend to, uh, you know, I, I like seeking the public markets at the right time if your company's ready and, and avoiding these late stage rounds and having the overhang, because it does complicate things. Um, so I can't comment on the, Star, the, the Starbucks stuff, but I think strategically it, it's nice to get a windfall at a high valuation, but it doesn't come without its exposures that you need to factor in as a shareholder, as, as an investor, as an employee. I think overall it's, it's probably a good thing because now you have different options at that stage. So if yeah. the company makes sense to go public, then it should go public. If the company, for one reason or another, needs to raise that $100, $200 million um, pre-IPO round to fund development or um, you know, international expansion, I think it's a, it's a nice option that they can raise that capital knowing they're still in a, in a heavy growth phase that they don't need to screw in the public markets. So if I'm a CEO, actually I, I think it's better, also as a board member, it's better for us too because now we have different options to raise that last chunk of capital that could play better with the strategy. I think in some so you're saying the revenues aren't there yet, they're still in build out mode, why go public and have well, that they tax? Could, sometimes they could do, they have the revenue to go public, but there's, there's two or three chess moves left to play. You know, yeah. you either want, there's another product offering you want to invest in, under the business, something would acquire, or I want to go international as a big expensive one, which is like, hey, I want to go to China, Europe. That requires a lot of cash. Doing that as a public company is okay, but you have to deal with the, the scrutiny of the public investors. But if that's the right strategy for the company to do it while private, there's capital to do that. So it's not right for every company to do that, but it's also not wrong. And I think if you're starting a company now, it's kind of nice to say, look, I can go public if that's the right story for me, but if I need to raise the money to do uh, a strategic acquisition or growth, I can do that as well. And so I think that option it benefits everybody. Yeah, I mean, the old days, IPO was about fundraising. You raise money on an IPO. So if you can raise $200 million in a private round with the complications, it might be worth it. So guys, you guys are pros. I love, love talking with you here on theCUBE. Uh, great to see you guys, Thanks. VMware alumni, uh, tier one VC firms, uh, NEA and Greylock, really pros. Uh, congratulations. I'll give you guys the final word I want you to share with the folks out there the hottest thing you're looking at right now from a technology perspective, not company, an area where you're digging in and you're peeling back and you're getting in uh, without re leaving, revealing all your secret sauce, uh, but what you're looking at, what's your focus? Well, obviously, you know, with the Docker investment, I've been spending a lot of time around that whole ecosystem from storage, networking, security, to management. So uh, that's a whole thesis that I've been spending time on. I'm still bullish on it for obvious reasons. You know, spending certainly a, a lot of time on that. And also, I think there's the this, this strategic question about Amazon, if they're going to take over the world or not, and the implications on that with infrastructure investing. And, and you know, if they take over the world, then there's, you know, we should just be focused on the app layer. But a lot of people, you know, that, that's not going to happen. But the question is who when. and when and how you play it. So I think trying to, trying to really figure out how that's going to play itself out has the biggest implication on that lower level investing. Certainly great time for entrepreneurs. I mean, I love the opportunities right now. I think with confusion is opportunity and right now the market is shifting. And uh, you know, Docker is a great example and those, you guys are doing some great investments uh, with open source and uh, this action. Uh, it's going to be fun. So good cool. luck guys. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. This is theCUBE with two awesome VCs, Jerry Chen and Pete Sonsini here at VMworld 2014. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.